Uh, <laughs> Uh, did they do a good job this morning? They did a great job, didn't they? Listen, you, you don't preach while you lead worship, and I, and I won't break out an air guitar solo while I uh, preach, all right? Uh, and I'll stop giving you a hard time about your hair as well. That just comes from jealousy, and the Lord says I'm not supposed to do that. Luke chapter 4 this morning. In Luke chapter 4, I want to look at the temptation of Jesus, the temptation of Jesus. Luke chapter 4, I'm going to look at verses 1 down to verse 13. We're in our fourth part this morning of our uh, story of Jesus, the story of Jesus. And we've been looking at how Luke is laying out this uh, uh, foolproof case, so to speak. He's laying out this uh, uh, very detailed story or elaborate prosecution of, as it were, of the case that Jesus is the Son of God come into the world as the Messiah, the Lamb slain for the slaughter. And so, anyway, we're, we're working our way through this, and we've worked our way through the birth narrative, uh, all the way through the experience at the temple, and uh, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit this morning through Luke chapter 3, which we find there the story of uh, his baptism and his proclamation uh, by John the Baptist. And I want to go to Luke chapter 4 this morning, and I want to look at this temptation, the temptation of Jesus, and see if we can glean some truth from it. I don't know about you, but anytime we go back and reread stories that we've read before, it's always interesting to me how oftentimes God begins to really speak back to us about things that maybe Maybe we've forgotten along the way, or maybe we missed it the first time through. How oftentimes we'll reread passages that maybe we've heard a thousand times before, and we just begin to see some new things. We see things that maybe we had missed in the past. And one of those things in the Gospel of Luke, as I've been looking at it over the last couple of weeks, is just how relatable Jesus is. A part of Luke's evidence that Jesus is the Son of God is the reality that you and I can understand God, that we can relate to God, that we can relate to Him in a way that we have never related before through the person of Jesus Christ. And not only that, but that God relates to us. That's something very specific that Luke, I think, wants to kind of lay out. In fact, I was thinking about my Bible college years this past week and how when we were there in Bible college, one of the things that was drilled into us over and over again in the years was how, how important context is to interpreting Scripture and, and what a fundamental role that plays. And no, no passage can ever be stripped away from its context. In other words, you have to understand what it originally meant in order for us to understand what it means today. And when you consider context, you have to understand authorial intent. In other words, what did the author mean? What was he trying to convey? And that's one of the things I, I want to point out this morning because we're going to see something in the temptation of Jesus that we have not yet seen. And there's a beauty in this because as you look at all of the Gospels, all of the authors, they write for various reasons. For example, in Matthew's Gospel, you know by now, he, he wrote to convince the Jews of the Jewishness of Jesus, of his Messiahship from a very Jewish perspective. That's why he constantly quotes the Old Testament. He's drawing his reader back to Jesus as the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament promises. Mark, by contrast, he's not as concerned with the Old Testament. He's more concerned with the report that his good buddy Peter has told him. And Peter was concerned with the power of Jesus. And so Mark over and over again illuminates or he illustrates or he's consumed by highlighting all the miraculous things that Jesus could do. John, on the other hand, he tells us a very theological story. He tells us that he wrote so that we may know Christ and having known him that we might believe in his name and, and have everlasting life. All through college, I was told that Luke wrote for the specific purpose of telling us about how Jesus came for the poor and the disenfranchised. And all of the evidence is there in the gospel to tell us that story, that part of Luke's story of telling Jesus is about how Jesus came to relate to those in our midst that, that maybe feel like they don't have an advocate and don't have a voice. One example of this, one of my professors noted, and I can remember hearing this for the very first time. He said, go to the Beatitudes in Matthew's Gospel and see how Jesus says that blessed are the poor in spirit. But then when Luke tells the same story, he tells the Beatitudes, he leaves off one word which singularly changes, as it were, or at least makes us think of something different because Luke only says, Jesus said, blessed are the poor. In other words, Luke wanted to highlight 
that Jesus was relatable, that God was knowable, and that Jesus had come for those who were most voiceless in our society, the poor and the disenfranchised. You might even point to the story of his Christmas. You know, Luke goes into greater detail in the Christmas narrative than any of the other gospel writers. And, 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 and some would argue that's because Luke wants to highlight the poverty to which the king of kings entered into this lowly estate. But as I've looked back at Luke and I've, the last couple of weeks and months and been preparation for this series and wanting to highlight so many times uh, uh, what Luke does in the beauty of his gospel and even in, in wanting to highlight how he presents his gospel to those who are disenfranchised because that's a message that resonates today, I believe that there's something even deeper there. I think there's a purpose within that purpose. And that is that I believe what Luke wanted to do when he laid out this ironclad case that Jesus was the Son of God, the suffering servant, the Messiah promised from eternity past and into the world that he had come for the poor, yes, but he wanted to come for the poor by showing them that he related to them, that he related to them and they could in turn relate back to him. Let me explain it like this. The Christian faith this morning, beloved, as we are going to see outlined in Luke 4, stands alone spectacularly in this one thing, and that, that is that the Christian faith alone offers a God who comes to man, is able to be known by man, and whom man is able to know as well. For example, the Tibetan monk, for example, he says that with a philosophical riddle, what God is like. But when you ask him, how, this, how do you know this or why it is this way, he says, it's better not to ponder such things. If you go to India and you, you spend time with the Hindus, their system cannot describe the sovereign. The sovereign is not relatable to them. And so what it does is it seeks to form a divine of everything that is imaginable so that they can find some way to describe God, right? Rather than asking the more difficult question of how can I know God, the Hindu system sets up everything as God. In Sikhism, God loves the poor and the oppressed. But then it says that we can't really know him, but we can simply show devotion to him through community service and charity and acts of devotion. But when Luke tells the story of Jesus, he says entirely the opposite. He says not only can God be known, but God can be related to in the person of Jesus. And not only can you and I relate to Jesus, but Jesus relates to us in his incarnation, in his coming, in his experience. By the way, I think that's what makes the Lord's Supper such a powerful moment. As the sovereign God of creation offered there at the table, he offered to his followers the opportunity to digest him, to know him, and to savor him. In the Christian worldview, God is worthy of our trust. He's worthy of our dependence because he did something that no other deity ever offered to do. He set aside the glory of heaven and he came to live with man, to be the image of man and to be tested like man in every way. The miracle of the incarnation was that God had a face. God had a smile. God even had a cry. In my view, I think that view that Luke wants to represent in his gospel as he tells the story of Jesus is that God did this so that we might know God and how to relate to him. And to understand that, we serve a God who knows our struggles intimately and our pain, a God who walked on our roads, so to speak, a God who experienced the human struggle and been victorious. Luke establishes it early in his story by telling us about the temptation of Jesus. From the first thing, from his birth all the way through his introduction into the world, G Luke is laying out the, that, that Jesus is the Savior that we can relate to, that we, that we have longed for. I got to thinking about this in depthly, and I thought about how uh, oftentimes, and I was thinking of an experience not that long ago at a wedding when one of a bridesmaids was asking me some questions about our family and our church, having met our, my, my beautiful bride, and we got to talking about our children, and one thing led to another, and I was telling her about Isabella, and I, I shared with her that we had a child that was born with a lethal form of muscular dystrophy that required 24-hour care, and immediately she began to cry. I paused for a few moments and, and I just kind of looked at her and I thought, wait a second, there's something here 
And so she began to tell me about her 19-year-old who had major handicaps and disabilities. And in that moment, there was a bond that was formed. I couldn't relate to all of her story. She couldn't relate to all of mine. But there was a place where our stories intersected. There was a bond that was formed, a point of relationship. And that's what Luke wants to establish. He doesn't want to just argue from an academic standpoint that you should trust in Jesus. He began his gospel in chapter 1, remember, offering it to any concerned person in the, in the form of this unknown figure, right? This Theophilus, right? He offers that, that invitation. Anybody who's interested in coming to Jesus, pay close attention. And he promises us that in the process of the telling of the story of Jesus, he will lay out an ironclad case. He says, I sat out to lay out this case, this, this orderly account before you. So that when you heard it, you could understand it. But laying out an ironclad case did not mean that it was going to be purely academic. It did not mean that it was going to be purely something that you understood with your mind. It was going to be something that you could relate to. Because the best stories are, aren't they? And when you get to Luke chapter 4, he has sufficiently laid out all the evidence that Jesus was the fulfillment of the law even before he had control over himself in his birth, in the prophecies fulfilled, in the declarations of, 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 of Anna, and the declaration of Simeon, and now the declaration of John the Baptist in, in Luke chapter 3. And when we come to Luke 4, it's almost as though Luke is saying in this moment, but wait a second, there's something even greater about his story that I want you to know. He knows what it's like to be human. The temptation for Jesus this morning, for this morning's purpose, is I'm going to break it down into three parts. And then we'll work out from there as quickly as we can. Following his baptism and his introduction into the world by John the Baptist, Jesus is immediately, we're told here in Luke 4, 1, that he's full of the Holy Spirit and he's immediately brought to the wilderness to be tempted. In fact, I would argue that the better word for the word uh, temptation here that we find in most of our translations in the Greek probably would be better translated to be tested. And in the story that unfolds as Jesus is drawn out immediately from this baptism to be tested, it's interesting how many, uh, how many uh, things in it are so uh, uh, sy symbolic or so similar as many commentators have noted to what the story of the Jews was that his readers would have known. There are so many parallels in the stories between what happens to Christ in the next few moments as what happened to the people as they exited from Egypt. You remember the people are brought in the Old Testament out of Egypt and they're brought to a promised land and they're where they're going to establish this new nation. But a journey that should have taken just a few, a few weeks somehow turns into some 40 years. Here in our story, we're told that Jesus was driven into the wilderness by the Spirit of God to be tempted or to be tested for some, listen to this, 40 days. Why? It was supposed to be a time of preparation. He'd reached that moment of his earthly purpose to reveal the kingdom of God and ultimately to move toward the cross. By the way, if you ever watched the movie, The Passion of Christ, there's an interesting moment, there's an exchange that is purely Catholic in its, in its theology where, where Mary is pushing Jesus to understand his purpose and to act on this. That's not what Luke shows us. Luke shows us a story where Jesus understood and was working towards this as we saw last week in Luke chapter 2. Even at the age of 12, he understands why he's here. But when you get to Luke 4, this testing time, this temptation, well, this is meant to be a time of preparation, much like the people in the Old Testament had to be prepared for what they were about to receive in the promised land. You see, the reason I think they had to go through the 40 years is not just their sin, but God had to get some of the Egypt out of them before he got them into the promised land. They needed to be shed of some of that old, old, old lifestyle, that generation of idol worship. They had never known anything different. So God is testing them, moving them along. Now, Jesus is sinless. Don't misunderstand me this morning. But in some way, there's this parallel that's being drawn. As Luke tells the story and he shows the similarities, it's as though he's saying this was the final preparation. 
Jesus had been raised. He'd grown, Luke 2, he'd grown in stature and grace and wisdom and with, with, the, with, with God and with man. He's going through that maturation process. That's a part of his human condition. And then all of a sudden we come to Luke 4 and it's as though Luke is saying, Jesus knew this is the moment it's about to begin. And there was one final preparation, one final thing, one testing, one something that had to take place. And the story gets relayed to us. All of that being the case, one particular verse in Deuteronomy 13 or Deuteronomy 13:3 sticks out to me, where the people of God were told that the purpose of their wanderings for those 40 years was so that God could test them and they would know what was in their hearts. Beloved, listen closely to me this morning. That is the purpose of all testing, all temptation. Moments like those, they they test us, they show us what's on the inside, what we value and what we don't. That's what Peter says in 1 Peter, though we be tested by fire, right? It's as though though all the bad stuff has to burn off of us in our testing, in our temptation. And so we know whether or not we're really made of that pure gold. In the same manner, Jesus is brought out into the wilderness in this moment for this time of preparation. Now, I want to say it again, not that he did not understand his purpose. We saw a week ago that he did, or that his heart needed to be revealed, but rather in this moment, it was a time where the Father brought him out to prepare him for what laid ahead. Got him ready for the ministry that was about to unfold, for the death on the cross, I think, even. And in this temptation, in this testing, he was faced with three specific tests that I think you and I can relate to this morning. First is found in verses 2 to 3, where we find out that his resolve was tested. We're told that during these 40 days, he ate nothing. Can you imagine that? Not me. I don't want to imagine that, right? He goes out into the wilderness for 40 days, and we're told he eats nothing. And then he's fasting, right? And then we're told this beautiful line there. At the end of verse number 2, listen to it. And he was hungry. You say, well, what's beautiful about that, right? (laughs) I mean, there's nothing beautiful about that, right? For most of us, at least in my kind of shape, right? I tell people all the time, I'm in a shape, uh, right? I mean, what's beautiful about saying that he's hungry? Well, it's a beautiful line because what Luke is saying is he knows what it's like to be hungry. This is the king of glory. This is God almighty. And Luke says he was hungry. God was experiencing the human condition of hunger. When our bodies don't have the sustenance that they need, we become vulnerable and weak. God was experiencing that condition. Often in this condition, we make poor decisions, don't we? We speak the wrong words, we become moody, or we even make poor choices. In this weakened physical state, the tempter comes to Jesus and he says to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. Now, I want to be clear this morning, he could have done it. And it would have been done. This was the creator of the universe that the tempter was speaking to. This was the inventor of physics. He wasn't, you know, some great scientist that just understood. He was actually the one who had invented physics. Jesus controlled every atom of existence and every subatomic material that holds the world together. And we see that in the changing of the water to wine, the controlling of the seas. Surely he could change the molecules of a few stones and make them into nourishment. But it would have been wrong for him to do so. We had to ask why. I've always wondered that over the years. What was so wrong? I mean, I would have, right? I mean, I was getting ready to make a really bad joke about Miss Kelly's cooking, but I didn't do it, right? I stopped. <laughs> I, I mean, we, I know, I know, it's terrible, but it almost came out, right? I, 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 I mean, I would have done it. I would have said, you know, I'm hungry. There's an opportunity here. I can do this. I have the power. What's wrong with that even? After all, he's going to turn water into wine. And if we were good Baptists, we'd have preferred that he changed the rocks into bread than that, right? I mean, that doesn't fit well with us. But it would have been wrong for him to do it. And he asked the question, why? And the reason why that we believe, or most scholars believe, is that in so doing, he would have forsaken his purpose. You see... The Father had sent him to live within the human framework so that he could redeem the human condition. 
So in a simple statement, he would have been rejecting what the Father had sent him to the earth to do, the purpose of sending him, to fulfill his wanting of his human will. We can relate to that temptation, can't we, this morning, beloved? When our bodies get worn out and weary, when we're challenged to take matters into our own hands and throw away God's conditions so that we can fulfill our human senses, right? Where we have these desires to just throw away God's purposes and plans, to just do things our way because, well, we're in control. First is resolve is tested. Second is reverence is tested. Verses 5 to 7, the tempter took Jesus up on a high point and he showed him all the kingdoms of the earth. With all their wealth and all the allusion to their power, he offered them to him for just a small price. Would he be willing to bow down and to worship him? One of my favorite sermons on this particular passage, Ravi Zacharias preaches on the temptation of Jesus. He doesn't use Luke's gospel, but his message on the temptation of Jesus always stuck out to me because in this particular one, Ravi says that there was a temptation of the imagination in this moment. First, first, the tempter said, I know your body's weak and worn out. Then all of a sudden he comes to this and it's as though the tempter is saying, but let's question your imagination for a moment. Let's question your reverence. You might think that such an offer were not even all that intriguing. You say, he's the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He's the son of God, the sovereign Lord. But wait a second, John 1 tells us that he came into the world and the world did not know him. Instead, it rejected and despised him. So... What the enemy's offering here in this moment is the appearance of the opposite. John says that when he came into the world, everybody rejected him. And the enemy says, you know they're rejecting you. You know they're despising you. You know what will happen. I will give you what you want now. I'll give you rule and reign. He'll give you obedience through conquering them. If you would just bow down. This is the key point. Jesus does rule the nations, and one day every knee will bow down and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. We hold fast to that truth. But there were parameters set upon that rule, apparently by the divine counsel in eternity past, merely that God the Father was going to build his kingdom, not through uh, conquering, but rather he was going to build his kingdom through the sacrificing of his son first on the cross of Calvary. There had to be a cross before there could be a crown. And so this test in this moment is an opportunity to have all that the imaginations desired without the parameters set by God. And all it would cost him was his reverence, his worship. All it would cost him was his worship. We can relate to that temptation as well this morning, can't we? Perhaps more today than any other moment in history when in the palm of our hands our imaginations are allowed to run wild forsaking all the parameters and the boundaries that God establishes in our living, right? We're tempted to reject what we view as Hitler, a totalitarian totalitarian control over our existence, but then what we do instead is we embrace Hugh Hefner, right? We can have all the temptation of the world, and it'll only cost us our worship. It will only cost us our reverence. But this is the interesting thing about such a temptation, and that's why it's such a great illusion. When I look back at Ravi Zacharias' message, I was listening to what he said, and I was reminded he spoke back of Oscar Wilde. And I've told this story before, and I don't even remember the first time I read Oscar Wilde's book, The Portrait of Dorian Gray, but I remember the impact it had on my life. Because in that book, Oscar Wilde basically gives an autobiography of himself. You remember the story of Dorian Gray? Dorian Gray is this beautiful individual, and he's got a painting. And every time he does something terrible, the painting is damaged instead of him. And so after years, he looks beautiful while the painting becomes this ugly, ugly creature, right? Ravi, he believes that it was inspired by a French philosophy of to live without boundaries. And the reason it's an autobiography of Oscar Wilde in the telling of this story is because that's who Oscar Wilde was. He lived his life devoid of any parameter. He wanted anything. He got it. He just let his imagination run wild. But here's what's interesting. Going back and doing a quick search, I I had not known this. What's interesting is that when Wilde lay on his deathbed, this man who had lived his entire life giving, giving whatever he wanted to his imagination and having it, he called for a priest to come and pray for him. And on his tombstone. He told his loved ones that he wanted a verse from the book of Job. 
the story of the man in suffering. What's the point in all that? The point in all of that is that what Oscar Wilde proved is what man has proven over and over again, that if I just give in to the temptation of imagination and have whatever I want for a lifetime, there's nothing more disappointing than to get to the end of that life and find out that none of it ever satisfied me, that none of it ever actually moved me forward, that none of it actually accomplished what the goal was. And what it did was actually only cost me my worship. I don't know if anybody else is as sinful as I am on these things, but I love those murder shows, right? Wives with Knives. I mean, it scares me a little bit, but I, I love those shows and those documentaries and those stories about uh, uh, these. Uh, they just, they, they're fascinating to me, and I know it's terribly sinful, and, and next week you can come up and share your sin with me, but I got hooked on, on one real crime show this week about the story of the Chris Watts family murder, and I... I don't know if you remember, it's from back in 2018, but basically not giving any glory to the sin itself. A, a man was giving into his imagination and decided to have an affair. And unbeknownst to anybody, he was the most loving father, a, a, a you know, devoted husband. Unbeknownst to anybody, he murdered his wife who was pregnant and killed their two daughters. And, and as, as, there, as I was watching this show, I, I, I thought, man, this is crazy. But then there was a part of me that started saying, this is so cliche. It's, it's exactly everything we might imagine, right? I mean, somebody gives into their imagination and it takes them to a place they never would have imagined until I got to the very end. And there was a story, there was an update that had never been shared because it just happened about six months ago. The FBI agent who had figured out what had taken place sat down with, with, the, with this, this, this murderer and, he, and she sat down across the table from him and she said, now that you pleaded guilty and all this is over with, there's no reason to lie. I have to know, what did you do with those little girls? He told one of the worst stories I've ever heard about how he killed one daughter in front of the other daughter and then dumped them into an oil tanker. And something inside my spirit said, how does a man become so evil? Here's the answer. It only cost him his worship. He gave in to the temptation of imagination, of living life outside of God's parameters. The FBI agent concluded that, that this, this murderer, every day of his life, spends his day in his cell with a picture of his wife and babies and just weeps and weeps and weeps. She said, are you a monster? And he said, I don't know. The point is, I don't think he got up one morning and thought he would do those things. But he gave in to a temptation, and Jesus faced that temptation, to sacrifice his reverence, to have whatever he wanted outside of the parameters of the Father's will. Give you everything in your imagination. Third test he had. He tested his resolve, he tested his reverence, then he tested his reliance. Verses 9 through 11, the enemy tempts Jesus to throw himself off a cliff, trusting that the angels would not allow harm to come upon him. This is a test to see if he would take his own life into his own hands. Would he make decisions for his own self and determine his fate? Knowing that, that he had been sent to endure the cross, would he try to seek to escape that, right? Would he put the Father to the test and see if he would be in some way preserved for the cross. I even wonder if the tempter told him the story of Abraham and Isaac. I wonder if the tempter really got into the Old Testament. You know, Luke doesn't tell us that part of the story, but I wonder exactly how he presented it beyond these words, you know, of just throw yourself off. By reliance, I want to be clear this morning, the enemy, he was really cunning. He made it sound as though Jesus could still trust God while taking his life into his own hands. Isn't that cunning? He was saying, go ahead and throw yourself off because God the Father, he will spare you. The Father would order such angels to protect you. But he was testing his human condition to rely on God the Father's plan that had been set into motion. Would he determine his own fate? He was saying, do you want your own destiny? Again, this is a temptation we all face. Who's our ruler? Who's our authority in our life? Do we take matters into our own hands? Do we trust the Lord and his plan in our life? Or do we take matters into our own hands, even testing God? Funny, quick of a funny story. I, in college, I would sometimes skip class, which I know you believe, because uh, it's true. And uh, that's why I won't run for president ever, because 
they'll impeach me over it. Uh, but on one occasion, the professor asked me whether my absence had been excused. And, and I, 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 I thought, well, you know, he comes from a different theological bend than I do. And I thought I'll be really cunning and have a, an answer for him. And I said, well, I wanted to come desperately, Dr. Furman. But before the foundations of the earth were laid, God predestined me to miss last week. Right? He simply responded, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Sometimes we are almost fatalistic. Well, whatever will happen will happen. I'll just kind of go through life, right? I'm just going to do whatever I want and it'll all just kind of pan out. But that testing is a testing of reliance. Whose plan are we going to follow? Are we going to act on God's plan or live life on our own terms? So we have the three tests this morning. We can certainly, I think, relate to each and every one of them. But what we can learn from Jesus' temptation is a couple of things, and I'll be done. First, the most beautiful truth of this passage is that it teaches us that we have a Savior who knows our weakness today. He knows what it means to be tested. He's experienced such testing, and he understands the struggle of the human condition. We have, in short, a relatable God this morning. We relate to him and he relates to us. He knows what it is we're going through. If you're worn out and weary this morning, I want you to know Jesus knows what that feels like. If you're tired and hungry this morning, I want you to know that Jesus knows what that feels like. If you say, my imagination has run wild, I want you to know Jesus knows what it feels like. You say to me this morning, I, I just don't know if I can continue to do this. And, and, and I'm, just, I'm just at the end of myself. Listen, Jesus knows what that feels like. But not only do we see that we have a Savior who we can relate to and who relates to us, but just as importantly, I think we see second thing, and that is we see how to fight temptation. You don't have to lose today. With every test, Jesus responded with these words. It is written, it is written, it is said. Beloved, the only way you will combat tests in your life, temptations, is through continual devotion, proclamation, and dedication to the Word of God. I'm thankful for the many avenues by which we are able to worship the Lord, whether it be song and singing, whether it be in giving, But I want you to know that it's only the word that has the power to overcome such things. God's word is the sustenance to our weariness, our daily daily bread. It is the parameters of our imagination and it is the affirmation of our reliance that God is trustworthy. There There is one more important lesson I want to give to you and I'll be done. Interestingly, both Matthew and Luke tell the same story with all the same details in exactly the same way but they end their tellings in different ways. At the end of Matthew's telling of the temptation of Jesus, it essentially ends with the beginning of his earthly ministry and the enemy is simply just kind of gone. But I want, you to, I want you to look at how Luke ends his story. At the final line, verse 13, and when the devil had ended every test or every temptation, listen, he departed from him until an opportune time. There's even a lesson there. Just because you've passed one test doesn't mean you're completely done. The enemy longs to come back to test you again and again and again and again. An opportune time. Three things this morning. First, we serve a God who's relatable. He knows what it's like to be you. He knows what it's like to be me. Not only that, but I can understand him and know him in the incarnation of Jesus. Second, He shows us how to beat temptation. In the story of Jesus, we have our hope this morning. You can beat back every test, every temptation, and every trial with the Word of God. And third, he tells us to be on alert because temptations don't just end because we've gotten one victory. Stand with me reverently and let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning and for the opportunity that you give.